Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in to this Q&A with Winton Marcellus today, Wednesdays with Winton. Um, Winton will be joining us in just a second, so if you want to go ahead and start asking your questions in the comments below. Um, I'm going to go ahead and not take any more of your time here, and we're going to let Winton join us right now. We have obviously a lot to cover and, and talk about today. Winton will be joining us in just one moment. Thanks for, thanks for tuning in. Here we go. Hi, Winton. All right. What you talking about, Maddie? How you doing? I'm, do I'm doing all right. I thought maybe you can kick things off here by just uh, talking a little bit about, you know, obviously you're in New York where many of the protests are happening right outside your door. What are you seeing? What are you hearing? And just kind of kick it off. Well, I was out yesterday. I was also looking, talking with protesters. And uh, you know, I applaud the use of civil unrest to put pressure on our politics and the uh, but also to show that our citizenry is, is engaged with the democratic process, then every form of activism is needed to affect change. We need people writing, we need people uh, intellectuals, we need people planning, we need people in the legal system, we need uh, people in corporations are doing what they can to, to affect uh, change in our business practices. So it's such a large problem in, in our nation and in the world, but in this specific case, it's our nation that no one group of people or one method or tactic will be successful. And it will not be a result of any one time. It has to be ongoing. Uh, and it's, it, we need reform. A general, this is a period where we're going to need reforms in general. It's been coming. We, we, we need it in our religious institutions, in our businesses, of course, and in our civic and in our cultural life and in our practices, more in our cultural life, because that's the field that I'm engaged in uh, and that I'm most qualified to speak on. Um, so I, I think in our cultural life, we need to look at the stuff that we ingest, mm -hmm. the type of trash that's said about black people all the time by whoever it is. And it comes from all races. Everybody loves it. Everybody participates in it. As you all know, I've been against it for many, many years, use of the N-word and all this kind of stuff and pejorative statements against people. And uh, all of this stuff is a part of one thing. Needless to say, uh, the political structure that we live in and the, 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 the strength and resilience of the Confederate narrative you know, I mean, they're strong, but the two don't have to go against each other. They weren't in the same. The Minstrel Show was popular during the Confederacy. Uh, it's just that a lot of the power is focused around maintaining a foot on black folks' neck. Uh, we know that. We live in this country. We step over homeless people every day, and a, a majority of them, at least in New York, are black people. We have seen the, uh, the, the gentrification of the city. I, I always, I mean, it's, it's, it's all over the country in the places I've gone. We see it, uh, we live with it. This, this moment is good to focus attention on it, but this, this moment is gonna be engulfed with many other moments that are coming upon us, mainly poverty. And uh, poverty and people not, not having enough to eat will, will, will come before a philosophical issue, before a social, structural issue. If you can't eat, you, you have no, you're, gonna, you're gonna do what you can to, to eat and feed your, feed your, your family. Uh, the, the this wealth disparity and the the, the inability and the I mean the the problem is so large and there's so many components to it. It doesn't matter where you put your hand, you're gonna touch it. And one thing I want to say in concluding what I have to say and opening the questions is that it does not matter what you say. There's gonna be pros and cons to every step of this very charged issue. But the point I like to make before this time when I was arguing with people, then I've engaged in this type of argument ever since I was literally 11 or 12 years old, is let me, let's not be philosophical. Let's look around and see what's going on. We have created the country we want. So we can argue philosophically all we want and we can go back and forth. But is education segregated? And, and let's not also forget that we tend to look at it as white versus black, but don't forget about a large mass of white populace that is exploited as hell. Not as bad as black people, but they, they're not, they, don't, they don't have access to agency to deny people stuff. The, one of the great kind of things that you wonder about in the Civil War is how did the South manage to get that many people to fight for, a, for the cause of, of a group of people 
for whom slavery was keeping the white people from working. So you, in effect, are fighting to keep a system in place that will make sure that you don't work. And it, it still remains today. A large portion of the American populace that fights on behalf of segregation and the Confederate narrative, this narrative affects you. You don't even have to look to black folks. It's one that keeps you from enjoying the life you could enjoy. So you never know when, uh, when, people, when people will wake up to the, to the truth of things. And like I was saying, um, as a citizen, some things are apparent to me, but I'm mainly in the field of culture is what I know about. And this is a time that requires us all to use our voices as citizens, but also to use our voice in our lane. Uh, because I spent so much of my life talking and filling up public space and arguing with people. and it, I, don't, I, don't, I don't feel a, a greater sense of urgency now. I always feel urgent about it. And that's it. Let's also be mindful of the fact that protests are very hard to control. Ralph Abernathy worked with Dr. King. He always said that, that the, in, in the civil rights movement of the 60s, they would go when they were going to have a, 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 a protest or a rally, they would go to all the pool halls and all of the places that would have people that they didn't want out on the street who didn't have the civil rights agenda say, please keep open. And if we can buy drinks for people, let us know because we want them to stay in these pool halls. We don't want them out messing our protests up with their agenda. And we're, we're seeing that in this. Uh, but I do believe that protests are cathartic and they've created change when there was also leadership and focus on political and legal solutions. Don't forget that fighting is about your ability to absorb punches and to deliver yours. And that there's an infrastructure so deep in the soul of our country. And there are some really, really, really bad intentions that are armed, they're violent. They're being given uh, permission by the leadership of our country to express themselves. And they also have a level of intelligent leadership, not, not in terms of, of the, the upper parts of our government, but think tanks and it's, 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 there's a lot out here. And, and everybody who's just out there just to blow up some steam, be ready for, what, for what's, what's out there because this thing is deep and it's, and it's for real. And just saying the slogan or, or not working on the day, this is not that type of pro this is not that type of problem that's going to be solved with those type of things. It's good to do that. It's, I'm, I'm in favor of it, but laws make a difference. Lynching was a pastime in America for a long time, but a new system. But then at a certain point, people start to get practical. Okay, we can't lynch these people. A new system comes in place. It's like this virus. The virus is like this now, but when it comes back, it's not going to be like this. It's going to be another thing. So instead of lynching, now it's a legal system that's so corrupt that basically you're thrown in jail at a certain point and you never get out of it. Uh, we have to continue to fight in every way we can, every reiteration of the Confederate narrative and this kind of nostalgic view of an America. There's always something in the back. Ronald Reagan was going to take you back to the 50s. Trump is make America great again. It's always some, some, something that happened back in the day that was great. Oh, we had them on the plantations. Everything was, you know, that's why you see the emergence of the N-word and all these things. It's a re-emergence re of some type of idyllic vision of when we really had our foot on people's neck for real and we could sell and buy people. Then America was really looking, look to the future. And the future is in collective creativity and all the values that are in jazz. The future is not in segregation. The group black and white itself are fake terms invented to create this narrative. We know now about the DNA. We know where people come from. The science is in. National Geographic had an article where they put, had to a black and a white twin on the cover and said, this is what we know about genetics. But always remember something I read in a book about, uh, about Nazism. I'm trying to remember the name of the book. It said, the one, one sentence was, prejudice survives all evidence. That's a fact. Doesn't matter what the evidence is. I want to believe this. And uh, we, we will change it. One day it will be changed. And one day the, the, all, all human beings will be able to see what the type of distance that allows us to identify ourselves and uh, figure out how to share resources and not need negative, not, not need narratives that force us to, 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 to denigrate people or, or, or treat people we won't we won't need that. I, I I know that I'm not gonna see that, but I, I believe in it. I believe in it's that it is the future of the world. And I also believe that jazz music has given us some keys of how to attain it. I get asked through, down through the years of 
What about something new? I always say the new thing is people are going to listen to it. So I stand by that. The new thing in jazz, somebody's going to actually listen to it and check out what the music is saying. But that tribalism feels so good. I just, uh, I don't know. So that was a long riff that I went on for y'all. Let me answer any questions that you, that you because we deal with, with, with serious subjects don't mean that we, we have to lose humor. You know, people go to their death sometimes, they're joking. The, the truth of the situation you're in is, is what it is. Thank you for that, Winton. Yeah, and right. I, I don't want to, I don't want to take up too much space here, but I, I'd love to just try to ask some of the questions in here. And and something I thought maybe to to kick it off, um, <laughs> you know, there's obviously you've spent your life telling, you know, the art of storytelling and protest through music, um, you explored greatly uh, and continue to do so, including the uh, ever funky, ever funky lowdown. If you could maybe talk about that a bit. Level Funky Lowdown is a record that we have coming out. And it's really about these times. It's actually strange. Two years ago, we uh, we premiered it. And it's a game that a, a man plays. His name is Mr. Game. People mistakenly thought it was President Trump. It's not him. Because it starts, on the, it starts with the right, but then it goes across to the left. And it just is a man who is playing everybody. So he's a, he's a combination of, of, of hustler, politician, snake oil, sales, uh, snake oil salesman, con, pimp, preacher he just puts every all these characters together and he he speaks in rhyme and he he sets up a narrative of us against them and he gets you into that us or them narrative and then once he gets you into that narrative he says we have to do something about them and then we decide we're going to destroy them now there were funky lowdown is all kind of funk grooves and stuff from new orleans when i was growing up which i, I tell everybody i played in the funk band and it's the kind of odd need of music my daddy and them would be playing james black is unbelievable new orleans composer it uses their language if it's one of my deepest regrets is this is one time i used my father and them's language from the 1960s he passed away he heard the piece but i want him to hear it really mixed so he could he because he would laugh and he see how i'm using using their themes but in the end he teaches the people a game and, and your game is you have to accept uh that you are greater than some other people that you mess over them and then it's natural for you to do that then the people you mess over have to accept your definition of them and sing and dance about on your terms how you how great it is that you abuse them, and that's the first half. And then in the second half, the peep the public who have gone along with this receive their prizes, and the prizes they receive are all things you can look out into the streets now and see: segregation, battle on the domestic plane, generational conflict, uh, racism, problems of constantly suing in, in, in the litigious way that we deal with each other, uh, constant surveillance of everything you do, every. Every prize that you receive is what we all accept and we have right now. And the final prize, and it's interesting to me because in the, in the Ever Funky Lowdown, my final prize that I'm going to give you is that you never have to do anything that is not directly pertaining to you. And the quote that I used in a Abraham, from Abraham Lincoln's speech, uh, not speech, a debate that he had with, with, uh, with, 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 with Mr. Douglas, the very last thing he says, the last word is self-interest that people believe democracy is not about anything but their own self-interest. So the ever funky lowdown ends with, then Mr. Game come back, come, comes back and tells us how foolish, and, how foolish we are because he's playing you. He, not, he, doesn't have a, he doesn't have a side that he's playing. He doesn't care whether white, black, whoever. I'm, playing my, I'm making some money. I'm playing a game on you. And then we conclude, I know I must fight. I don't tell us how we're going to fight, but we have to fight. And you, it's, it's, it's a constant battle. And uh, in, this, in this country, we have a certain dynamics. But as I traveled around the world, I understand, understood this is a dynamic that has plagued the world. And a good outside source to read for people is Caesar's conquest of the Gauls. He breaks it down better than anybody. But we'll have Togo wearing Gauls, and these are ones that we kind of like. That will be in New Orleans like a Creole. And then these, there are these Gauls way over here. Boy, when you get to them, they're the wildest people. They're going to come here and eat everybody's babies, and they're going to do this. We've got to go destroy them now. So uh, the Ever Funky is very biting, and it has a narrative. And I'm saying exactly, you know, I work on these things for a very long time, and I consider a lot of things when I, when I work on them. This is, it's inspired by conversations I have with my little brother Ellis, who we've, been, who we've called the Oracle for a long time, and all he does is read and study. And he's been doing this his entire life. So when he tells you you're somebody who did actually read the health care bill, he read it. When he tells you stuff, you can check him. And uh, we've gone back and forth on issues for a long time. 
uh, not always in agreement on everything, but I've learned a lot from, from these dialogues with him, mainly because of the integrity he has about what he pursues. And uh, he lives in Baltimore. He, he lives in the hood. And he's always saying, man, all these experts on the hood, they don't, they don't, and what about an expert on the hood who's not in the hood? He don't know about it. But he also, also says that a person does not have to prove their authenticity to speak that the quality of their ideas is their authenticity. So, uh, you know, that's the ever funky. And we're putting it out. We, 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 and everybody works so hard on it, all my beautiful singers. And, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't even know what to say about just the work that they all did on it. Todd, everybody in orchestra, of course, is so dedicated. Um, and you're going to see a lot of what's in the ever funky is in what's going on right now. And it's also related to a piece that I wrote in 1999 called All Rise. But All Rise, it was written at the behest of Kurt Mazur, who was then the conductor of the New York Philharmonic, who grew up in Nazi Germany and was a, a paratrooper for the German army. And he said, uh, write a piece that brings people together. And this was in 1992 or three. It took me 10 years to develop the skill to write for a symphonic orchestra. I couldn't do it. And he would start teasing me every time I saw him at Lincoln Center. Are you still afraid to write for the New York Philharmonic friend? Are you still afraid? And he would always tell me. When he told me what he wanted me to write on, he said, Let me, he said I grew up in Nazi Germany, see, a member of the Hitler Youth. He said, if you were in Nazi Germany at that time, you were a member of Hitler Youth mm -hmm. because you did not have the right to say something opposite what a group of people were saying. So when you get caught up in this whole kind of group mentality and you got to follow people, he said, you don't understand how thin the line is between civilization and barbarism. And the thing you don't understand about what was going in then was the type of cheering that went on for that agenda. And uh, he was, of course, a lifelong enemy of that agenda, but he was caught in it. And uh, he made me understand there are many, many uh, engagements around the world. And, and this in our country, is we're on the forefront of it because our cradle is freedom. And Mr. Game talks all about uh, democratic freedoms and what are we willing to, to pay to ensure those, so on and so forth. So yet yeah, Ever Funky is coming out. It's, and, uh, it's and Ever Funky. <laughs> it's funky too. It's, it's, it's all the way low down. It's been, I've heard some of it. It's, it's truly fantastic. And, and another uh, uh, talk about protest music, Black, Brown and, uh, Black, Brown and Beige which was yeah. the JLCO, very significant yeah. that the JLCO recorded it and we released it. Can you talk a bit about that significance and, and that suite? Well, you know, Duke Ellington, he was always on the forefront of, uh, of, of civil rights. It's just who he was. And uh, you can't do anything in civil rights that Duke didn't do. He, he fought that battle for so long. He wrote some of the greatest pieces of music ever. And as a person who's in culture, people say, what can I do? To, to fight against this, learn the music of Duke Ellington. Listen to his music. Black, Brown, and Beige is a great place to start. He was reviewed terribly for it. Mm -hmm. Too sophisticated. And when you have a certain level of sophistication, here comes that other level of prejudice and ignorance. And it's in institutions all over the country. And that is, it's good head rubbing liberals. If you don't want to bow your head for them to rub it and tell you, you okay with me, you're a good boy. And Duke did not want his head rubbed. Now, all of a sudden, all the friends of the Negro are against our greatest musician. Why? He's too uppity. He's not looking for me to tell him who he is. This still exists today. And uh, at this point, of course, we all, white, black musicians in the, in the Jazz Lincoln Center Orchestra, a lot, a lot of our young musicians play. We've come up under the pen of Duke Ellington. So we speak in the language of Duke. And that is a language that is universal and is so clearly against racism and a violation of rights, human rights, that uh, when you play his music, you are doing something against it. When you listen to it, when you know it, when you understand who he was, when you know the history and you read his writings, it's in everything. Um, and, it's a, and it's hard to play. So it's an honor for us to play it and it's an honor for us to play with our younger musicians fantastically as they played. And also we were under the direction of Chris Crenshaw. So he did a great job working with the scores of Duke and, and conducting us. And uh, I like old little Sam Chess from Arizona doing that tricky Sam that and trombone part, making it sound like somebody crying. Go ahead, Go ahead Sam. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and speaking of, of Ellington, Duke Ellington, I mean, 
obviously that's that's why you started essentially Ellington and this still celebrating our 25th year and doing something we've never done before the first uh, ever virtual international essentially Ellington Festival June 8th to June 12th next week if you'd like to speak on that a bit yeah we're gonna we, we have our bands we have our alumni lineup I want you all to join us and be a part of something historic it's never been uh, anything like this with the depth of intergenerational, interracial, uh, intergenerational, interracial com people coming together to celebrate an American master that spoke on all aspects of Americana. And uh, Dukes, we, we have 25 years of, of alumni, some of the greatest musicians and people in the world. And we're going to have a Skane's Domain where we're going to talk about stuff. We're going to have virtual jam session. I was listening to it today. We sent tapes around with our musicians playing and some of the younger musicians playing. We've got some young people that can play around the world. We have uh, five international bands. They're going to be fantastic for you to hear and meet. I've been judging them. Each band takes me like an hour and 20 minutes to write all the comments, you know. If I could get up from, from here and, and with, with dead space, I might go get one comment sheet so y'all can see how much work this is. But Todd just made me happy because he told me I could speak my, my comments into it. So you know what, man? You keep people busy. I, I want to show you all this so you can know how seriously we take this. Oh, fantastic. And if you're tuning in, Winton is, is going to get, and we're talking about the uh, international, first ever virtual international, essentially Ellington Festival. A festival. It's a 25 years of celebrating essentially Ellington. The uh, Jazz Lincoln Center education team and the whole organization worked so hard to put this on to make sure these kids, I call them kids, these high school students, these young adults, get their chance to really show off all the hard work uh, just because we, we couldn't have it at our hall this year, wanted to make sure that we're really able to highlight them. So what are you showing us, Winton? Okay, this, this, is, this is a judge sheet. And this is a, a high school, a beautiful high school from, from Beloit Memorial High School. Okay, and this is, this is my adjudication. I don't know if y'all can see it. Do y'all see your writing on that? Oh, yeah. Letters? Let me tell you something. This is a pain in the booty. And it's sheet after sheet like that where I'm talking to the band directors and explaining what I hear on their tapes about what's wrong. And there are five of us judges, and we're all doing that. And we're all talking. This Here's another good page of it, of good handiwork. Wow. And uh, it's everything from, you know, what who's playing in time, how bass players play, and all this kind of stuff. And uh, the, five of, the five of us who are judging are going to be very, uh, very busy doing that. I want to shout out to my man Jeff Hamilton, who's not doing it this year. He's he's he's, he's uh, he have a few little, little slight issues with his health, but mm -hmm. I love him. I miss him. I miss him. Me and him sitting up laughing, and we're gonna be back in the saddle. But um, just hearing these young people lifted my my spirits up. You know, I'm I'm, I'm hearing Beloit. I'm hearing a group of kids from the Bronx. I'm hearing a band in in Texas, Agora Hills out in California, and uh, every year has gotten better. The solos have been better, playing more authentically into the feeling and vibe of Duke, inventing stuff, making up new things. You know, so, yeah, we're in Essential Ellington now, and we're going to prove that we're a part of, of, of the movement of now by being for real about his music. Mm. And, and if you're just tuning in, we're talking about, uh, hopefully you can join us uh, next week, June 8th through June 12th, for the first ever international virtual Essential Ellington Festival. You can head to jazz.org to figure out how to tune in, it's going to be live streamed on Facebook and a lot of really, really great um, being able to highlight the next generation of jazz musicians and talking about the next generation of jazz musicians. Are you hearing right now from musicians who are inspired to convote, compose new music as a response to what's happening today? I'm not hearing so much from, from people who are inspired to write new music. As a matter of fact, we were looking over the last year and a half for musicians who were really deeply socially engaged and we, as a programming team said, it doesn't even matter what their position is on Jazz at Lincoln Center. Let's get them to uh, to write some music. We need more people out here with a kind of civic and a social rights consciousness that uh, they, they want to speak with, uh, they want to speak on it. I'm, I'm sure of the younger ones I'm, I'm hearing, we're talking now. I got a couple of musicians called me from, from, uh, from Minneapolis. They were out in the protests. Mm -hmm. We talked two nights ago. And we had a long conversation. It was very, it was revealing. You know, I just was listening, trying to learn from them. And they just said there are a lot of elements at play. And the things they said they learned was just how what you see in the media has nothing to do with what goes on in the ground. 
Mm. And it's just a level of systemic corruption in all of the systems we deal with that we as a nation are going to have to figure out how to, how to attack. And as I, I've said, it's a problem too great for one person or one group of people. It's going to take the participation of millions of people. And with the participation of those people, we will see changes. But if you think one person is going to come down here and address corruption in churches, corruption in the voting system, corruption in, in, in putting people to, 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 in the prisons. Look at the work Brian Stevenson has done. That's one person, create a whole movement. It's gonna take many people, you know? And uh, my younger people are, are fired up. I've been teaching long before this moment to them. You see the people of different races come together. Understand the racial reality in the United States. Don't pander to people. Mm. We jazz musicians. We've been trying to come together in this country long before any of this. People threatened Benny Goodman's life for putting on a concert. Now that's a long time ago. But of, of, of everybody, let me know the next time somebody threatens your life and you put your concert on. And they're for real. And not like today where it's like, you know, you're gonna get to sue somebody. So we have to understand our tradition, let alone the tradition of Louis Armstrong. And you know, all that. it goes without saying the type of stuff Duke Ellington went through. And I could tell you stories about stuff Duke dealt with that I heard from older musicians. And it'll break your heart. But it's part of the legacy of this country. So, you know, I'll tell a story about it. They were playing a dance somewhere. And they got somewhere in, a, in Illinois or Indiana. <clears throat> and the people who were at the dance, the rednecks were at the dance, they were mad at the way Duke Ellington was dressed. So they pulled a bunch of pistols out and guns out and they said, dance. Okay, well, this is Duke Ellington. What is he going to do? Then they started shooting. What you think he did? Okay, he was, it's not like today where, you know, you could put a slogan up and you're a revolutionary. He was like, okay. He had to handle the moment he was in. You know, like people always tell you, as a, as a joke, can't say if, we, if they act good for good, they say, I'm going to show you I'm from the hood. <laughs> I'm going to start running. Like this is not a TV show. It's not a movie. So you think of the great Duke Ellington and the, the types of, of various humiliations he had to deal with. And he was also conscious of what it was. So you didn't have like a person who was not conscious. But what he returned with was always something that was uplifting to our humanity while still conscious of what it was. He never turned his back on it, put a smile on it, and everything is beautiful, boss. Don't let people put you in the position where you have to turn against people of goodwill and people who have the same way you are because they don't look or act like you. It's stupid. It's foolish. And it's to go back into a tribal past that's not going to end well for you, whoever you are. The future is not tribalism. If you're going in that direction, you might think you're going to get revenge. You're not going to get it. Thank you for that, Winston. And, and, and on I got to be for real about it. You know, I yeah. got to be for real about it. I don't care how mad people get. Who those travelers? Great, get mad. You know they've been on me for years about this stuff, and that's the, I'm okay with it. Well, I mean, and 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 on that too, I know you mentioned uh, uh, Brian Stevenson. Um, he, we were supposed to, you know, in in April have a show, the JLCA with Wynton Marsalis, special guest Brian Stevenson. Can you talk a bit about that um, that show that we were supposed to have, and hopefully we'll we'll have it in the future. Equal Justice Initiative, you know, what Brian is about. He's one of the greatest Americans <laughs> fighting for civil rights. Now, these shows are planned years in advance. It's, it's just funny that our whole season this year uh, was about social justice. They have a funky lowdown coming out, Black, Brown, and Beige, uh, 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 Benny Goodman's uh, music, of, of the, 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 as a jazz ambassador. Everything in the season was designed to be about these moments we're seeing now. So mm -hmm. Brian, we are gonna sit down. We weren't prompted because there was a protest to bring Brian. We were already gonna bring him. Uh, we, all of us have looked at him and, and respected him, have so much love and for, for, for what he has done to help to make the constitution, the state constitutions, the, the judicial process be more fair. And even with all this unbelievable work to, to shine a light on lynching and injustice and the fact that it still exists in a different form, Think about how much more work needs to be done. And then think about how much resistance there is to that work and the intelligence of that resistance. So yeah, I had a chance to have a conversation with him the other night. And I mean, he's, he, he's what he is. He's fighting a good fight. 
you know, integrity, cannot be bought or sold. He, he's he, <laughs> he's been doing it. He didn't just get out here last week. He's been out here. And he's, he, he don't sleep at night. You know, and he's, he's, there's no superlatives I can find to talk about this man's vision, his team's vision, the symbols they are putting up, the way they're trying to get us to come to grips with what our history is and has done. And, uh, you know, we are, we are a nation of slavery and of subjugation, but we're also a nation of freedom. And I always have to take us to remember something and everybody to think about it. Nations who, whose cradle has nothing to do with freedom, when they beat people and they kill people and rape and slaughter and terror stuff, they don't go back and apologize. Genghis mm -hmm. Khan never apologized to... Hitler wasn't going back saying, man, I'm really sorry I did this. The reason the apologies and the redemptive posture is so important is because we are supposed to be about freedom. Once you say you're not about freedom, <laughs> you don't have to apologize to anybody. Or you have to say, you know what? I'm not really about freedom. I'm about dominating people and taking their stuff. If they can beat me, great. If not, sorry. You know, the bully don't have to apologize. Just wait for the next bully. But we have to make a decision who we want to be as a nation and how do we prize being. And then we no longer have to take people that we have victimized and also make them guilty. So you put those two things together, like you're going to pull a, pull a guy like Gary Tyler off a bus in the 1970s, he's going to spend his entire adult life in jail because he, because he wasn't guilty of something. You're going to take a teenager and beat the hell out of him, grown men, then throw him in jail forever. And you're not going to one time say, what we did was wrong. We are sorry. We regret that we did that. You can't get redemption. You can't get peace and rest in your soul. You can't get that if you don't apologize to yourself for dumb stuff you've done. So think about it. Thank you for that. And, and on that note, too, I'm just going to give it back to Winston just to wrap things up. And thank you so much, Winston, for taking this time to remind everyone to not only fight now, but fight for the commit to the rest of your life to fighting for for injustices and, and for freedom and continue to do that. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back again next week. I'm going to throw it right back to Winston. And once again, hope you can join us uh, next week, June 8th through June 12th for our first uh, ever international essentially Ellington Festival. Uh, Winton, you want to wrap things up? Yeah, I just want to say, you know, this is a very emotionally charged time. We got to direct that emotion with, uh, with intelligence. And we, if we want to see changes, always go funnel that emotion and understand that, that if you want to see changes in, a, in, an, in an institution, push for the changes you want to see. Don't waste your, your, your energy. You know, the police have a union. They have qualified immunity. They have a grand jury system. And they've been conditioned by behavior to do what they're doing. It's like drunk driving. Mm. If somebody has citations, they just keep drunk driving because they want nothing has ever happened. The, the officer who, 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 who murdered Mr. Floyd in public had had 18 complaints against him. Okay? Now, my job is, of course, this is not new to talk about these issues. I've talked about them in prisons, high schools, in penthouses and outhouses, it doesn't matter where. I've been soapboxing my entire life. My mama soapbox. My daddy did it. It's okay. It, it's, it's an inflection point. But let's understand, it's the underlying mechanics that lead to victory. It's not the halftime. It's not the half halftime. I was listening, looking at the TV and somebody asked Steve Young. They were saying, man, when you go into the Superdome, it's, it's a lot of the fans and everybody's cheering and they have such an advantage. Man. What were you thinking about when you when you walked into the dome? He said, I was thinking about Ricky Jackson and people on their defense. You have to fight what is in front of you. You win the game against that defense, not against the fans cheering and all that. That helps. But the coach said, let's go get him. Or, or you know, it's like a boxer telling him in the corner saying, hit him, hit him, man. I'm trying to hit him. He's hitting me. So we got a, we, we got a battle. I hope that by the time I die, that I see some, some improvement in our culture and our understanding of the destruction of words, ideas, the way people are portrayed, and then we stop going for the okie doke in my field, the field I know about. I wish I knew enough about politics to really be intelligent in my discussions of them, but that is not what I've studied my entire life. I've studied Afro-American, 
and American music. And I don't divorce them. They're one and the same. And if you wish to divorce them, you're inaccurate. That's, those are musical facts. Mm -hmm. For your political agenda, great. Good luck. But I believe as strongly in the rights of, of, of black people to stop being messed over on all levels of our society. Because it's not just going on in the street. It goes on everywhere from the street to the New York Times. Believe me. To the, to the best universities. Mm. Remember what our administration was when Black Lives Matter was born. Who was the attorney general? Who was the president? Remember, we need to be out here holding people accountable for the nation we want to see, all of us. And, and, and it's going to take all of us in our own way. So thank you very much. I always love talking to y'all. The serious subject. Okay, we can be serious, but the fact that we're serious doesn't mean we still can't play around and joke and still go back to being serious. And we're going to be doing all of them next week when you see all these young people in here swinging. Thanks so much, Winston, and thanks everyone for tuning in. Thank y'all. Yeah, you're right.